No, don't do that. Stop. Just to double check, you can see the next slide, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. Paracelsus was the father of toxicology. He states that all substances are poisons, that there is nothing that is not a poison. And I maintain that that is pretty much true. It's the dose that makes the difference. I can kill you with aspirin, but it's not particularly easy. It takes a large amount over a long period of time, but I could put five pounds of aspirin in a sock and beat you over the head with it and get the same job done. So dose makes the difference. I will talk a lot about the LD50. The LD50 is the lethal dose 50% of the time. That means that if I gave everybody in the room the same amount of a poison, half of you would die and the other half would wish you had died. <laughs> so LD50 is an important number to remember. A poison bites you and you die. A venom, it bites you and you die. Whoops. A poison sort of bite it and you die. So you take a poison and it kills you. A venom is a snake, a, a spiny newt, a frog or something like that. It bites you or it touches you and you die. So that's the difference. A layman thinks of a poison as something exotic, an arrow poison, a magic potion, a medicine man or a witch doctor. Doctor, They rarely think of the poison that's in our immediate environment. The medicine cabinet, under the kitchen sink, in the garage, growing on the side of the road, for sale at the newest plant. So if I teach you one thing that you don't know now, it's natural and organic does not mean safe and healthy. Natural and organic are two of the buzzwords that really get me going because they do not, and I must repeat this, do not mean safe and healthy. Over-the-counter meds and herbal substances are drugs and you need to tell your physician about them, but we can use these over-the-counter medications and herbal supplements as poisons. And acetaminophen is the most dangerous drug in your house. Not the most toxic, but the most dangerous because it has a perception of safety and it's a hidden ingredient in so many over-the-counter products and prescription drug products for that matter. So that's my safety talk. Now we'll get on to the fun stuff, how to kill somebody. <laughs> Poisons have a unique appeal and a special sense of horror. They're silent. They leave few or no signs of violence. They're generally inexpensive. They're readily available. They can kill the individual or the masses. They can kill at a distance of time or location. So no face-to-face -face messy encounter. They can be difficult or impossible to detect, making deception easy. Often poison isn't even initially or ever suspected. There may no longer be a crime scene to investigate and any evidence that might have been collected might be lost, contaminated, or degraded. The best thing about poisons for a mystery writer is that there are so many factors that can affect how a poison works. I can tailor a poison to the specific needs of the story. The only limitation is the imagination of a writer. Imagine that a poison causes a miscarriage or a birth defect, something like lead. A poison that doesn't kill directly, but makes a person unable to care for themselves and suspect susceptible to illness and die, say, of pneumonia, something like mercury. A substance not normally considered a poison, acetaminophen, a poison the sudden lack of could kill. 
think ethanol withdrawal symptoms. And so uh, the lack of ethanol can kill. Examples of people who thought out of the box, Tony Hellerman used a radiation in people of darkness. P.M. Carlson used a parasitic worm, trichinella, from undercooked pork uh, to eventually cause a death in gravestone. And Mar Mar Margaret Marion used lead in uncommon clay as a glaze on a pot that uh, people drank out of and uh, it caused a fetal abnormality. And that's the motive for murder years and years later when the mother finally runs across the potter. Desirable characteristics of a poison. When poisons are tested, they're always done on animals and they're marketed usually as pest control. So some of these may sound a little strange. A high degree of toxicity, i.e. a small dose can kill. The manner in which it kills does not arouse suspicion in survivors. A single dose or multiple small doses can kill. Ease of use or administration. A high degree of specificity. You really don't want a poison that kills everything. Something like nicotine, where the saying is, if it breathes, it dies. So you don't really want to kill everything. The possibility of an antidote, persistence, half-life in the environment. You don't particularly want anything downstream or downwind or uh, decay products to be killed. So no secondary poisoning. Solubility. Solubility is important because if you can't get it into the body, you it can't be a poison cost. So you have poisons like uh, plutonium, which only a, a, a nation state could use because it's incredibly expensive. You need specialized labs to manufacture it. Um, so something like that, you don't really want an expensive poison. You want something that you can go to the pharmacy or the grocery store or the plant nursery and buy for a couple of dollars. Availability, so plants and or something that you can order through the mail. And you would be absolutely amazed at what I can order through the mail. It's not quite like the old days pre 9-11 when you could order anthrax through the mail. I know this because I have the catalog that uh, allows you to, that list anthrax and tells you how much it would cost. The only reason I don't have anthrax is that we decided at the time that it was one of the few poisons that might be too toxic to have in my house. My poisons are kept in a locked glass fronted cabinet in the kitchen, and we call it the toy box. So LDFD. That can be changed by duration and or frequency of exposure. So that means an acute, a subacute, a subchronic, or a chronic poisoning. Think arsenic. I can kill you in a day or two. I can kill you in a week or two. I could kill you in several months to several years, or I can kill you 30 years out. Um, just by the dose I give you of arsenic and the length of time I give it over. So. Strychnine is a really interesting poison because we think of it as something that kills very rapidly. And oftentimes it does. So the onset of action of strychnine might be say 15 to 30 minutes and it causes convulsions and the convulsions last for three to five minutes. And then because you've used up all the energy in the muscles, the body relaxes until that energy can be restored by, by the body. And then you get another contraction. You can't breathe, but you can see, you can feel, you can hear and contract. Think of the most painful leg cramp you've ever had and then make that every muscle in your body contracting and you, you can't relax, you can't breathe. Again, contractions last three to five minutes and the body relaxes. As these muscle contractions occur, 
they generate a lot of heat. So say you uh, get to the hospital and they're able to give you an antidote. Well, there's no real antidote for strychnine, but they're able to treat the symptoms and you survive. But the body heat, your core temperature may be 108, 109 by the time they get you to the hospital. So two or three weeks out, you're going to start having uh, multiple organ failure. And so you might die in two to three weeks. So although we think of strychnine as an acute poison, I can make it so that you die in two to four weeks of multi-organ failure. The same thing could be said of cyanide. You get somebody who works in an environment where they're, they're burning something and cyanide is being generated. They get very small doses over a long period of time. So you may not see toxic effects for days, weeks, or sometimes even months. So we think of cyanide when people ask me for instant death. Well, there's no, well, there's very few things that can cause instant death. There are a few things that cause it on the indrawn breath, but cyanide comes close. It can kill you in three to five minutes. So we think of cyanide as an acute poison, but it's not, but it, there are circumstances where it can be a subacute or even a chronic poison. So routes of exposure, inhalation, mercury. We think of mercury as something that you would be exposed to orally, but that's not true. Metallic mercury is not toxic orally. You take the mercury from a broken thermometer and drink it or eat it, or a kid eats it when he's playing with it, and the mother rushes the kid to the hospital. The doctor gives the mother a Valium because really this is not a problem and the kid a cookie. Metallic mercury is not toxic orally. But you take that same metallic mercury and balance it on top of a light bulb next to where a person sits to read and the heat of that light bulb vaporizes that mercury and the person breathes it in, they get what's called mad hatter's disease. So essentially they go insane. You have power of attorney, you put them in a nursing home, they catch pneumonia because they don't swallow correctly and they die. So that would be a very convoluted way to kill somebody, but it would also be basically unprovable. Now, don't think that this is one of the ways to kill somebody and not get caught. It kind of sort of is, but I do have a workaround. I have a, a sign that a coroner could detect so that you can make this into a murder and have a murder mystery. A murder that, um, sorry, a poison that can't be detected or even suspected does not make a murder mystery. Yes, I can kill someone and not get caught, but there's no point in me telling you about that. And Mercury's about as close as I'm going to tell you about that because that doesn't make a book for you. You have to have a death and you have to have something that arouses suspicion so that the death can be investigated. So Arsenic, we think of arsenic as something you take orally or maybe in extreme cases, you can absorb it through the skin. But if you burn arsenic, you get arsine gas. And so arsenic gas is perfectly possible. Other routes of exposure, and this is basically going down by what is the most to toxic. The lungs have an incredible volume of surface area. So something that's inhaled is going to be the most toxic form of it, generally speaking. Then mucous membranes, so under the tongue, um, vaginally, nasally, just through a mucous membrane. Then oral, that's the most common route of exposure. So, but even then you have things that you can change. Is it a liquid or a solid? Is it taken on a full stomach or an empty stomach? Did vomiting occur? Is it soluble? Does it, uh, is it soluble in water or does it have to be soluble in fat? Which 
would delay absorption and mean that you have to give it in, say, a fatty food so that the poison might be absorbed? Is it a, a, an insoluble salt that has to be broken down by the acid in the stomach? Um, so there are lots of different ways that you can change how something is absorbed orally. Injection is it give it intravenous, that's the fastest way, intermuscular or subcutaneous. Subcutaneous is probably a little faster than uh, intermuscular, but that's a close thing. Or give it, or is it something that's applied topical? Something like dimethylmercury, DDT, nicotine, clonidine. Is a vehicle required or a vehicle or a carrier required for the absorption of whatever it is through the skin. So do I need something like DMSO that I buy at the health food store or maybe hand lotion or sunscreen or something like that? Then we get down to chemical factors. Is it fat soluble or water soluble? Is it organic or inorganic? So toxicity ratings, the probable lethal dose for a 150 pound man. So super toxic, that's a taste, less than seven drops. Extremely toxic, between five drops and one teaspoonful. Very toxic, between a teaspoonful, a teaspoon is five milliliters and one ounce. Uh, moderately toxic, between one ounce and a pint. Slightly toxic between a pint and a quart, practically non-toxic, more than a quart or more than 2.5 pounds. That gets into the things like glue, crayons, um, a lot of things that we have around the house that we never would have even considered poison. Well, they are under the right circumstances and at the right desk, but we consider them practically non-toxic. So this is a horrible slide and I apologize for it. Um, I took this off the internet and there is a newer, more updated slide, but unfortunately I haven't figured out how to take that one off the internet. This is just a general speaking thing that will tell you, refer, refers back to our last toxicity. Under toxicity four, you can see acetaminophen. So if we go back to the previous slide, acetaminophen is uh, moderately toxic, um, about an ounce. Actually, the LD50 for acetaminophen is, has been lowered uh, three times in the last 20 or so years. Started out at, at uh, about 20 extra strength tablets, then it was decreased to about uh, four grams and that, well, to about eight grams, which would be 16 extra strength tablets. And now it's down to three to four grams. Um, if you're in my hospital and I'm treating you and you're on any product with acetaminophen, it will carry a note that says the maximum dose is four grams per 24 hours no matter what form it's given in. If it's given to reduce your fever, if it's given uh, for mild body aches, if it's given for extreme pain, if it's given at night to help you sleep. So it doesn't matter what form it's given in, four grams is the maximum dose. And if you drink alcohol, acetaminophen and alcohol are synergistic drugs. That means that together they work they're more effective than either one alone. So this is a case where two and two, where two and two does not equal four, two and two might equal five or six. So um, that's the synergy between aspirin and, and uh, sorry, acetaminophen and alcohol. So secondary poisons. So if you have, or you needed to do something where you didn't give the poison to the victim directly. You could put a hive of bees next to a, a clump of oleander or henbane or ginseng weed or oleander or even milk vetch, which we all grow for um, the butterflies. You could put there and then the hot 
honey would become poison. You might need to have the cow eat the poison plant and then the milk becomes poison. Remember Abraham Lincoln's mother is thought to have died from milk from a cow that had eaten white snake root. But there are other more effective poisons than white snake root. Autumn crocus, which is actually one of my favorite uh, poison plants, poison plants, henbane, um, yew, all kinds of things. So synergy, we talked about synergy briefly. That's when two things produce an effect greater than the sum of their individual effects. So multi multiple drug overdoses are significantly more toxic than single drug overdoses. So if I took all of the poison plants in my yard and ground them up and uh, in the in the coffee grinder and put that it would look exactly like Italian seasoning. And you could put it in your oil and vinegar and it would settle to the bottom and it would look exactly like Italian dressing. You would have no way to differentiate whatever's at the bottom of that Italian dressing or Italian seasoning that you mix. I have a picture of that, but I didn't put it in this, this talk. Sorry about that. But that would be a mixture of poison plants and it would be, the dose would be smaller and they would be significantly more toxic than any one of those drugs alone. Now the dogs brought me a toy. There are biological factors, age, the very old and the very young are more easy, are easier to kill. Dose, size, Dose is generally measured in milligrams per kilogram. So if you have a small individual, the dose is going to be smaller. Sex. Some things are more toxic to women or something that would cause a miscarriage would not be a problem for any man, but would be a problem for the woman. Health, individuals, pre-existing pre conditions. Uh, are significantly more susceptible to a poison, uh, a poison that might exasperate the condition they already have or might uh, add a new condition to that. Someone already taking medication for an illness allows for the possibility of drug-drug interactions or increasing the dose to cause a drug overdose. Nutrition and diet, so remember when they say not to take a particular medicine if you eat grapefruit? Well, that grapefruit would cause your in liver enzymes to um, increase, and that might either increase the uh, breakdown of a drug or else if it blocks a particular enzyme that you need might, or a particular pathway, might uh, decrease the amount of metabolism that the drug has. Environmental factors, season, temperature, rainfall, humidity, location. Some poisons are significantly more toxic when they're harvested in the winter time, some in the spring, some when it's new growth versus old growth. Some seeds are more toxic than the parent plant. Sometimes the seeds are the only non-toxic part of the plant, which allows for birds or animals to eat the seeds and then disperse them over a wide location, uh, ensuring the survival of the plant. So all of those things make a difference. So herbal medications are not regulated by the federal government. They, they're not classified by the government as drugs, so they're not tested. So that means that if you're buying, um, say, uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Uh, if you're buying Yohenbane, Yohenbane, and you're taking it early, the box of Yohenbane you bought today might not necessarily have the same ingredients, the same concentration of the drug 
and it has a box you buy next time because it might be that the first box was in, harvested from new growth and the second box that you buy say in the fall is harvested from old growth so it's not as potent so all of those things make a big difference um so something that grows in a hot texas climate like hemlock would be more toxic than hemlock grown in um a cool northern climate like Connecticut or Massachusetts or Pennsylvania or Southern Canada. Uh, castor beans, castor beans are not toxic in the spring because the plant material is not particularly toxic. I mean, if you ate enough of it, it would be, but um, you, it would, it's toxic in the fall because the seeds are are the toxic component. And so you, you don't get those until late summer and fall. So Chinese ladder fern, that's not a particularly poisonous plant, but if you grow it in soil that contains arsenic, it accumulates, it bioaccumulates the arsenic into the Chinese ladder fern. So that would be a way to poison someone with arsenic when you're not giving them arsenic directly at all. Uh, ergot is a fungus that grows on the ovaries of grain. So you see that uh, usually after a uh, hard winter when grain stores have been depleted. And so you've gotten down to the bottom of the silos and you, you're harvesting the grain probably that was grown when it was a cool wet growing season. Uh, so the fungus has a chance to grow. I mean, and it grows on the ovaries of grain. Who knew that grain even had ovaries? So mushrooms, mushrooms are more common in the spring or in a cool, wet summer. I got my times mixed up, y'all, and I had intended to take those dogs and lock them outside so that they could not be doing this during a talk. So a distribution from the site of exposure. The highest concentration of a poison is not necessarily found in the organ or tissue in which it exerts its maximal effect. So if you give somebody lead over a long period of time, it's going to be found mostly in bone, but it's organ that it affects where it exerts its toxicity is the brain. Did you ever wonder why pathologists take samples from multiple parts of the body? It's because poisons distribute themselves throughout the body in different ways. And you don't know, when you don't know what the poison is, you have to be prepared for testing all kinds of different things. Um, urine is the most common form that you would see excreted urine, uh, excreted poisons. Uh, because you're in, most water-soluble poisons are going to be excreted by the kidneys, but most fat-soluble organs will be excreted by the liver in uh, bile. So the pathologist will take samples of blood, of urine, of the liver, of kidneys, of muscle tissue, uh, all kinds of places where the poison might be stored in the body. Metabolism. So the bile transformation, the body is, body's attempt to detoxify a substance. Sometimes the metabolite is more toxic than the original compound. Pro methanol and propylene glycol are two really good examples of that. Methanol is a one carbon alcohol, whereas ethanol is a two carbon alcohol. So methanol is metabolized in the body to formaldehyde. The antidote for methanol intoxication is, and for propylene glycol, which is antifreeze, the antidote for both of those is ethanol. When I lived in Michigan, then when there was a big snowstorm predicted, the homeless people would drink antifreeze and they would wait 20 to 30 minutes and come into the ER and tell the ER physicians exactly what they had done. 
because they got admitted to the hospital. So out of the cold, nasty weather, they got administered alcohol. So they got drunk. They were given food. So they got fed. And when they were discharged, they were given clean clothes. So this was a win-win for them. Um, organophosphates are usually more toxic when they're metabolized in the body. Uh, many medications are actually what we call a prodrug, a drug that has to be metabolized in the body into its active form. Water-soluble poisons tend to be excreted by the kidneys, whereas fat-soluble poisons tend to be trans uh, biotransformed and excreted in the liver or stored in fat cells. So the physician might even be taking uh, fat cell samples. The amount of chemical or poison stored in the body, usually in bone, fat, muscle, sometimes in solid organs, is known as your body burden. The average person, for example, has about seven milligrams of arsenic in their body. But it's not a problem because it's bound up in bone and it's not available to the, the body to be, to be a poison. So I probably have a significantly higher body burden because I handle arsenic, I have arsenic, I um, talk about arsenic, it's in my kitchen, sometimes it's beside the bed, uh, I take it out to take pictures. So uh, thanks to me, y'all can have a lower body burden and the average will still be seven because mine is probably so high. If a poison is sequestered in tissue, bone, or fat, it isn't causing a, it isn't causing a problem. But in times of stress, say malnutrition, pregnancy, extreme dieting, then the chemical or poison may move from an inactive form to a more active form or location in the body. So. That's another thing that you might do. You might have exposed your poisoner a long time ago and the poison is stored in their body, but say you have some influence on that person and they go on an extreme diet and then the poison might be liberated to cause a problem. Excretion. So primarily it would be the GI tract, but it can be milk, it can be bile, it can be urine. It can be bound up in bone, which is considered a form of excretion. It can be bound up to hair, fingernails, which is a form of excretion. It can be it exhaled via the lungs. Think a uh, breathalyzer for alcohol. They're not measuring. I mean, if you refuse a breathalyzer, which is a field test, then you have to go and have a blood test. Uh, one of the reasons you might uh, refuse a breathalyzer is that the longer it takes for them to draw a sample, the lower the amount of alcohol in your body. So uh, let's go back a slide. I forgot to tell you something. Oh, no, I told you. Um, so a poison that's excreted from, via fingernails or hair something like arsenic, but most heavy metals, then you can measure, you can take a hair sample from that person and you can, we know how fast hair grows and I'm making up this number. Say it grows a fourth of an inch a month or say a fourth of an inch a week. And so you take this hair and you cut it up into fourth of an inch lengths and you test them. And one fourth from the first fourth doesn't have any poison in it. And maybe the second fourth doesn't have any poison in it, but the third and the fourth have high levels of arsenic. So we know that three weeks ago, three and four weeks ago, you were exposed to a high level of arsenic. And say maybe the fifth length of hair doesn't have any arsenic in it. So we know that this was a one-time occurrence in week three and four. But you go out further, say, and you're looking at the 10th length of hair, 
then and it has a high level of arsenic in it again well then we know that somebody has been exposing you to arsenic at a fairly significant level oh and we can actually tell what that dose was by the concentration in the hair so we know if it was a high medium or low dose but we can tell that um, two and a half months ago at week 10 you were exposed three to four weeks ago at uh, links three and four you were exposed. So that gives us a way to measure how you were exposed in um, exposed to a poison. Now hair and fingernails don't degrade in the grave or it degrade extremely slowly. So after a body has been embalmed, there is very little chance of finding a poison because you have introduced a number of chemicals into the body and uh, uh, they've just diluted out or washed out entirely the poison. But if it's a poison that's excreted into hair or fingernails, then you can still find it there because embalming wouldn't have anything to do with hair or fingernails. And even if they washed your hair and your hands in preparation for burial, that poison is still in the hair itself, inside the hair and inside the, the nails. So um, heavy metals are, arsen are like arsenic and mercury and lead are also the only things that can be found in cremate, cremated remains, cremains. So when you cremate someone, all of the poison would be burned up except for something like arsenic or mercury or lead or cadmium or bertillium, any of the metals. So the elimination of a poison, drug or chemical from an organ or from the body is expressed in terms of half-life and is defined as the amount of time required for the disappearance or elimination of half the poison. So one half-life is 50% of the elimination, two half-lives 75%, three half-lives is 83%. And generally speaking, in the hospital, we consider the length of time for three half-lives and for every drug and every poison, the half-life is different. We consider three half-lives is the drug is effectively out of your body. So if you're going to go in for surgery and you're on a blood thinner, then the, they're going to tell, depending on which blood thinner is, they're going to tell you to stop taking it between four and 10 days prior to surgery uh, because it needs to be eliminated from the body. And again, depending on which drug it is, that el elimination time, that half-life is different. So as I said, generally three lives is considered the active life for a poison of a drug. But this can be skewed, shall we say, by a number of different pat, uh, different factors in the body. So if it enters a recirculation pathway in the body where it's excreted in by the liver into the bile and then reabsorbed in the GI tract from the bile and recirculated through the body, those half-lives can be very complicated. So a poison with a very half-life can cause a death after a long time after the exposure. So a long-acting anticoagulant, what we call a super warfarin. So this is a rat poison that I can go down to my feed and grain store, our farmer's markets, uh, not farmer's market, but farmer's co-op store and buy this super warfarin for about $5. And that would be enough to kill you. Well, it would kill you fairly quickly because the half-life for a super warfarin can sometimes be eight months, nine months. And so if it takes three half-lives to eliminate it from the body, then I've got to keep you alive one way or the other for 24, 20, 
27 months, can't multiply in my head today, apparently. So that's an incredibly long time. So that's a little over two years that this poison would be acting in your body. So why do we have these long acting, these super warfarins? Well, it was because originally we used warfarin, the same drug that we use in humans. So if you have AFib and an artificial heart valve, you have to be on warfarin for the rest of your life. And its side effect is bleeding. And if you get too much warfarin, then your body can't clot. And that's one reason why people who are on warfarin tend to have these really nasty bruises, um, why they have to be particularly careful, why if you're in a car wreck, they're gonna ask you immediately, are you on warfarin? Um, because they're not gonna be able to control any kind of bleeding, bleeding in post-op situations, bleeding after an accident. Um, there are antidotes that we can give you, but we have to know so that we know what we're doing. But rats became immune to warfarin over time. And so now we have these super warfarins, which have the incredibly long half-lives. And um, while they're, they tend to be very effective at, in killing rats, if a human is exposed, it's a very different proposition. So diagnosis, history, what happened to the patient or others is the most important, although not the most reliable evidence. People lie. So if you bring somebody into the emergency room, they're going to ask you what they could have taken at home, what they might have been exposed to. If this is say an intentional overdose, they're gonna tell you they weren't, they didn't take anything, that they weren't exposed to anything. If a family member's bringing them in and they don't know, then they might not be able to tell the ER physician. Or if they're embarrassed, they might not want to tell the ER uh, physicians. So history, while it is the most important uh, tool we have, it is not always the most reliable. The second most uh, important tool is the physical exam. So we look to see, are you bleeding? Is your blood pressure high? Is your blood pressure low? Is your heart beating in the correct rhythm? Um, are your pupils dilated? So we look at things in physical exam. The next would be routine or toxicological testing. Um, discrepancies between physical exam, land, lab test, and history may reflect intentional deception and or a brief or prolonged interval between exposure and exam. So going back to the antifreeze, the people had to come in and tell the physician exactly what they took. They have to wait long enough that you couldn't pump their stomach and get the, the antifreeze out of them. But they have to, but when they go in, they tell the physician exactly what they did. Because a brief exposure, a brief time between the time they drank the propylene glycol and the time they hit the ER room, well, nothing's going to show up in the blood work. So a very brief exposure can mean that the drug hasn't yet had a chance to be metabolized to something that you would test for, or it could be a very prolonged interval so that the drug is actually out of your body. And now we're dealing with whatever it did, it did to injure a tissue or an organ or something uh, while it was in the body to cause a damage that might cause death, but the drug is actually gone. A patient may exhibit damaged tissue or organs long after the poison has been eliminated. So think about something like alcohol. Alcohol damages the liver, but 
at any given point in time, you may not find any alcohol in the victim. And the liver is a very forgiving organ. You really have to kill off about 80 or more percent of the liver before you start seeing symptoms of a poisoning. So the liver is a very forgiving org organ and alcohol may or may not be found at the time of exam. Another plant would be some, another example would be coyotilla. Um, coyotilla is a plant that grows here in the Southwest. It causes a peripheral ascending neuropathy that kills when it finally gets up to the lungs. But you, you are given the coyotilla or you take the coyotilla and there are no symptoms for weeks sometimes even months. And then the symptoms will begin in your toes and feet, gradually per, uh, ascending up your legs, um, your thighs, into your abdomen. And then you don't die until it reaches your uh, diaphragm so that the diaphragm is par paralyzed and so you're not able to breathe. So this would be something, um, botulism would be something similar. Um, so uh, the poison is out of your body and you may not die for many months, maybe even years. Um, another example might be lead. A small dose of lead over a long period of time and then stop taking the lead. Well, uh, nerves have been damaged and that damage can't be fixed. The body is not able to fix uh, to fix those problems. So, and there are a lot of others, but um, another thing is in the examination of the surroundings where the victim is found. So a physician would ask you, were there any pills on the table, uh, any medications around, what was in the house, what did the victim have access to, or uh, a forensic examiner might ask, what uh, someone else might have had access to. So food, chemicals, uh, other victims, over-the-counter medications, herbal remedies. So the most common drugs that are tested for, so if you hit the ER uh, and they are drawing blood because they don't know what's wrong with you, they send it to the lab, the drugs that they're gonna test for are acetaminophen, aspirin, opioids, so codeine, morphine, heroin, fentanyl, benzodiazepines, say Valium or Xanax or Ativan, cocaine and its metabolites, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, potocannabinol, um, fencyclidine, PCP, and alcohol. These tests can be performed rapidly and are relatively easy and inexpensive. So they're just going to say, do a toxicology panel. These are the drugs they're going to test for. A negative result may simply mean that the drug has had time to be eliminated from the body. A negative result might also mean that you haven't tested for the right chemical. So it is not possible to tell the lab, test for everything. That just isn't a reasonable request and it's never gonna happen. Um, there is no single test for poison. There are some broad spectrum tests now uh, that weren't even available when I started uh, at my career as a pharmacist. Um, so there are some kind of shotgun approaches but really the physician needs to say, these are the symptoms, these are the drugs that I suspect. And so this is what I wanted to test for. That's one reason why a mixed drug overdose or a mixed poison plant overdose is significantly more effective because you might have symptoms from more than one poison. So it would be very difficult for the treating physician or the pathologist to pinpoint what particular drug they need to test for. 
In contrast to rapid screening, comprehensive testing, uh, screening of blood, urine, other body fluids by grass, uh, gas chromatograph or max spectrometry, those are expensive. They're not always readily available. So I live in a little bitty town in central Texas. If I went to my hospital and it's the only hospital in about a 40 mile radius, they don't have a GC mass spec. So they're not gonna be able to test for something if I come into the ER. They're going to either have to draw the samples, preserve them in the correct way, uh, draw them in the correct way. I should, for one thing, because you know when you go in to have blood work drawn, and they do more, uh, more than one vial, and the vials have different colored tops. That's because the preservative or uh, the testing medium or whatever in each vial is different, and so you can't just draw a blue top vial and send it to the lab and say, "Here, test this." because it might not have the right preservative in it. It might have something that interferes with the test. Um, so you have to take a lot of different samples and send them in, and then they have to test them all. And that is expensive, not always readily available, requires the samples to be preserved and collected in a specific way. So a sample that has to be kept cold uh, would be totally different from a sample that needs to be kept at room temperature. And if you don't preserve it in the correct way, then you're not going to get an accurate result when you test. If it's a case that might go to court or if it's a forensic case, then the chain of evidence has to be maintained. Um, a lot of these tests take a considerable length of time to perform, and there's always a backlog. So you send a sample to the lab. Uh, we're used to, say, a TV show saying D DNA takes 10 days, and that's even if you put a rush on it. The lab might be backed up, and it might take months. Well, the same thing is true with uh, testing for poisons. The lab is always backed up and it can sometimes take considerable length of time. I don't know if you, any of you've ever had or known somebody who died under questionable circumstances, but the autopsy results, unless the police are really pushing it, will not be completed i.e. the toxicology will not be completed for usually two to three months. So there is a backlog and they take a long time to cons conduct. They are generally specific, not broad spectrum. So again, you have to give the lab some idea of what they're looking for. If they're looking for arsenic or heavy metals, they're not gonna find, well, propylene glycol or an organophosphate pesticide. Extensive comprehensive testing rarely leads to a change in patient management, disposition, or outcome. So I suspect something unusual and I send it off to the lab and they have to send it off to one of the, the labs that could test for it, say in Texas, that might be Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, El Paso. So they have to send it off. Uh, that takes time to get there. It takes time to run the test. So the physician in the hospital is managing the patient on the symptoms he sees. So if your blood pressure is low, he's giving you something to increase your blood pressure. If your heart rate is slow or beating in an irregular fashion, they're going to give you a drug to increase your heart rate or to, to even out that arrhythmia. Um, so the disposition, that's the final out. Um, that's what's going to happen. So are you going to survive this or are you going to die? And outcome is usually the same thing. A good example of this is a case in a hospital where I worked in, when I lived in Michigan. And again, it involved a homeless person drinking antifreeze. 
but this homeless person had broken into one of the big manufacturing companies. I worked in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids has lots of uh, heavy industry. And, she, and in the winter times, in the very cold parts, January, February, uh, sometimes December, they put antifreeze in these heavy machines in order to not have them seize up. So she had broken into one of these factories and drained the alcohol out of one of the heavy machines, drink, drunk it, gone to the ER, told the ER what she did, i.e. drank antifreeze. And so they started treating her as an uh, antifreeze overdose. Well, she got sicker and sicker and sicker, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And they tried all kinds of different tests. And she, uh, and she did last for a week or two in the ICU, but eventually she died and they had no idea why she died. Um, another week goes along and the heavy metals tests come back and they're positive for all kinds of heavy metals, mercury, lead, uh, cadmium, bertillium, all kinds of heavy metals. And what they theorized happened was that the antifreeze is a solvent and it dissolved or picked up contamination from this big heavy industry machine. And when she drained that propylene glycol off, she accidentally poisoned herself with all these heavy metals. But again, the testing didn't come back for weeks. And so the test had no, out, no, no difference, made no difference to how the patient was managed to how, what the patient's outcome, i.e. death, was. Urine is the optimal substance for analysis due to the longer window for detection and higher concentration of drugs or metabolites. So if you draw a blood sample, the poison may be out of the blood, but if it's being excreted by urine, then, um, you're gonna be able to find it for a longer period of time in urine. And if it's a metabolite, you're gonna find it in urine and the concentrations might be higher than they would ever have been in blood because blood is being diluted, but urine is concentrated. I know that we are probably running out of time. Let me see if there's anything else you really need to know. Um, Cause there's a bunch more slides. Anybody will tell you that I am absolutely incapable of talking to time, but uh, just doesn't happen. That's because I like what I'm talking about. I find it very interesting um, and because there's just a lot of information. So um, can I make a suggestion for a second, Lucy? Sure. Um, maybe we could, um, I know people were planning um, um, on an hour. Um, maybe we should see if there are any questions at this point. And right. while people are thinking of a question, whether they want to unmute and say something or put it in a chat, that will give you a second to think of um, anything that you want to not of you know, anything you want to definitely include because I want to be sensitive to any plans people have for the afternoon. Uh, right now we're at 1230 on the East Coast. Um, are there any um, questions? Um, I'm not seeing all of your, uh, okay, Catherine has her hand up. Go ahead. Hi, Lucy. Um I did have a couple of questions. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, I was wondering about pesticides. Um, are there any certain ones that like you could put in a drink that would have like a, a quick effect on killing someone? Um, most of them actually. So it just depends on what you have available and uh, what symptoms you want the victim to show. Uh, and how fast you want them to die. Is it something that could be put in alcohol? I'm wondering. Absolutely. And they could die like, I know cyanide is the quickest way to, to kill somebody, but 
how long would you say what, like a couple of hours maybe or something for a pesticide or again it, it always depends on the dose and the form that it's given if you give a high enough dose in a liquid form, say with an alcohol that would uh, facilitate absorption, then we could uh, kill somebody in 15 to 20 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. If you need it to be longer, then we just change the way we do it and uh, we can make it longer. But um, I would say probably 15 to 20 minutes is about as fast as a pesticide would act. Any particular one you can recommend? <laughs> <laughs> one of the organophosphates would be very good. And the thing about organophosphates is that they are readily absorbed orally. So if you don't want to give your person some, something to drink, then you can have, uh, have them be exposed in a different way. They could either inhale it or you could uh, spill your drink on them and the drink could have the pesticide in it. And then, um, you know, if they're in a party and somebody spills a drink on you and you're not in your home, you're not going to go change clothes. So those damp clothes are going to be next to your skin and that pesticide is going to be available for absorption uh, into the body. And so death then wouldn't be right away. We're talking here maybe up to 30 minutes to an hour, again, depending on dose. Um, but there are all kinds of things. So um, I would look for something like malathion or... Um, oh, I'm sorry, what was it, malathion? I thought malathion, um, the old Roundup's, not the new Roundup. Uh, Roundup's been reformulated, but um, a parathion, uh, Again, that one's not on the market anymore, but you find it all the time in garages. I see it when I go to, I go to garage sales or uh, farm estate sales uh, because you can find the most amazing poisons in somebody's garage or out in the barn if it's a farm. And I am the, the weird woman who is looking in the garage and picking up all the cans and reading the ingredients to see what's a good poison and then quickly storing it away in my little basket so that I'm the one that buys it. Um, but uh, just because something's not on the market now does not mean that it's not easily available. Uh, but I would look at malathion, parathion, um, anything that's not, um, I want to say car carnation, but that's the, uh, they are based on carnations, but that's not what they're called when they're on the poison label. But just look at the label and um, newer poisons will actually give you a rating that uh, you can look up in reference books and it'll tell you like on that toxicology scale where it is. Um, if you want to uh, email me, I put up the my information again so you can get my phone number so you can text me you can get my email so that you can write me a letter um so i mean write me a letter <laughs> send me an email um again feel free to nag but if you want to email me or text me i can give you a list of different pesticides um people don't think of nicotine as a pesticide but if you remember say 15 years ago on public radio and in the organic um, gardening magazines, they all talked about how to extract nicotine from cigarettes and use it as a natural, organic, safe pesticide. Well, nicotine is one of the most deadly poisons out there um, it you die in about 15 minutes and the rule of thumb is if it breathes it dies when it's exposed to nicotine so even nicotine a really easy thing you can go to any smoke shop and buy it uh, that's a whole different lecture um, but don't forget about that that one when you're thinking about pesticides I'm gonna give you two more slides and they are reference books. 
Oh, that... okay. I was just going to say we've got a couple of um, questions in the chat about some uh, reference books. So um, I won't so, read them right now. I'll let you go ahead and post that. And the people who ask those questions, if this doesn't answer your question, um, flag me, you know, raise your hand or something and, and I'll go back to that. So <laughs> Common Poisonous Plants and Mushrooms is my favorite reference book. I use it constantly. There's one in the car, there's one in the living room, there's one on the bedside table. I've worn out multiple copies. It is the best book, but it is no longer in print. So it's a little difficult to find. You can find it on eBay. You can find it on Amazon. There was a Kindle version. I have a Kindle version, so I can look things up on my phone. It's not available from Amazon anymore, and I don't understand why. Um, this John Kingsbury Poisonous Plants of the United States, that's an older reference that's from the 50s. Again, you have to look in used bookstores, eBay, Amazon to find copies of it, but it is a very good book, but it doesn't have good illustrations. So Common Poisonous Plants and Mushrooms has wonderful illustrations. Um, just a down and dirty book you want to look up is um arsenic poisonous and arsenic's not a plant so you can go to poisons and antidotes and just look it up and it'll give you a very brief little synopsis you know, like two paragraphs that'll tell you about arsenic and these two are historical reference books so my copy of dixon man forensic medicine and toxicology is from about 1902 I have an earlier copy uh, from the 1860s or 1870s, but it's getting very fragile. And this Taylor's Principles and Practice of Medical Jurisprudence is also another excellent historical reference for uh, poisons. You can find these books for free on Gutenberg and some of the other uh, websites that give you text that are not not under copyright anymore. You can still buy these as a text or as a Kindle version on Amazon. I just uh, bought a forensic medicine and toxicology several months ago as a new text so that I wouldn't be wearing out my book. But it's uh, when they scanned it in, they didn't do a really good job. So it's not really easy to read. But I also bought a Kindle version for less than $10. And so you can do a word search on the Kindle version and it'll take you exactly to arsenic or exactly to um, cocaine. And, and it will tell you how, what the symptoms was, what they knew about it in the, whenever the book was published. So the 1800s or the early 1900s, it'll tell you how it was tested for if it could be tested for at all. Uh, so the, these are really good reference books. And um, I recommend these two highly. I recommend all five of these reference books highly. But the Dixon Man is my favorite for historical references and Common Poisonous Plants and Mushrooms is my favorite plant book. Again, I'm gonna put my information up. Um, yeah, Lucy, we have another question. Um, and I, I, I think this is the last question. Um, I'd like to um, see if we can get an answer to this. And um, if anybody else has a question, put it in the chat now, because I think we need to wrap up soon. The question, Lucy, is um, the website that listed the toxic compounds by the rating. I think, Jenna, you, are you referring to the pages that Lucy said she downloaded? It was too small to read. Is that the one you mean? Yeah, or the more current one, because she said there was an even more current one that she yeah. had up on PowerPoint. But if you have the website for that, or- I don't the, have the website on me at the moment. I would have to look it up. But okay. if you Google um, poisons by toxicology rating, it should come up. Um, okay. But I don't, but you can text me and I will find the website and send it back to you. Great. Thank you so much. 
Okay, I, I think I, I think Lucy, I think we could sit here and listen to you all day, but I, I feel like I need to wrap this up just out of consideration for plans people may have for the afternoon. Um, okay, there's one last thing from Jenna. I see your hand up. No, that's just me clapping, thanking. thanking oh, it's her. clapping. Okay. Um, Grace, thank you so much for the talk. <laughs> Lucy, thank you so much. I'll echo, echo what Jenna just said. This is just loads of information and we appreciate you very, very much. Well, it's my pleasure to do it. Mystery writers give me untold pleasure. I read books more than I do anything else, I, more than I watch TV. Um, I listen to audiobooks while I'm walking, while I'm working in the yard, doing the dishes, taking care of my 90 year old mother. Um, so I, I get immense pleasure from all of the books that you write. And uh, it's my pleasure, my opportunity to give something back to a community that does so much for me. And I'm happy to talk to you about different subjects, you know, um, arsenic being my favorite, uh, but it is about an hour long all by its little lonesome self and poison plants, which I'm working on putting on the co computer and you just pick out which three you want and I'll shuffle them up to the top because uh, you can talk about poison plants forever because there's just thousands of them. Sounds good. Okay, well, we may be seeing you again sometime then. So thanks everybody for attending and Lucy, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you very much. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.